Hey everybody. Today we're talking about statistical power and sample size. The basic problem is this. You're planning a research study and you want to control the probability of both a false positive, a type 1 error, and a false negative, a type 2 error. The most intuitive and simple way to do this is by choosing your sample size appropriately. So let's work through an example to get at some of the complexities involved in this question. Suppose we want to test the null hypothesis that the population mean we're interested in is 150 against a one-sided alternative that that population mean is actually less. To keep things simple here, let's assume that we know that the population is approximately normally distributed with a standard deviation of sigma equals 25. So um, in planning this study, we're going to have a sort of acceptable probability of type 1 error and acceptable probability of a type 2 error. So let's set those things at alpha equals 0.05, the significance level of the test, the sort of permissible probability of a type 1 error, and a um, beta of 0.10. That's the maximum probability, maximum permissible probability of a type 2 error when in fact the true population um, mean is 140. To say this latter statement slightly differently, we're going to want a statistical power of 90% for an effect size of 10. By the way, both of these numbers, alpha equals 0.05 and beta equals 0.010, are reasonably standard. Uh, I think beta equals 0.20 is even a little bit more common. So the question is just, what is the minimum sample size that we can get away with in this study? So we're going to use two conditions here. The first is going to be our condition on alpha, and the second is the condition on beta. So let's start with alpha. Here we're assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So the sample mean x bar is going to be normal with mean 150, the same as the population mean that we've assumed under the null hypothesis. The standard deviation is going to be 25 over the square root of n. That's the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. With this information, we can compute a critical region for this test. It's going to be one-sided, and of course, it's going to depend on n. Here's a picture illustrating it. Let's let the value C represent the cutoff for this critical region. Now we can do a direct probability calculation using the normal CDF uh, for the, the, norm, the, the normal CDF for the standard normal distribution. Let's call that phi. So if we take that critical cutoff value for the critical region, C, transform it to a z-score, and then apply that normal CDF, we should get 0.05. That's the probability of the type 1 error. It's the area of that shaded region on the left. We know that a z-score of negative 1.645 corresponds to that cumulative probability. And now we have an equation with two unknowns. So just for convenience here, I'm going to solve it for c to get c equals 150 minus 41.13 divided by the square root of n. And of course, we acknowledge that that 41.13 does have some rounding in it. Now let's use that second fact that we have, that the fact that our beta is going to be 0.10 when the true mean is equal to 140. So here we're taking into account the maximum permissible probability of a type 2 error. So we have a similar picture. Now we're assuming that the true population mean is actually 140, so we've centered a normal distribution at a different spot. Uh, we do still have the same standard deviation, 25 divided by the square root of n. This time we need uh, an area of 0.10 to the right of our critical um, cutoff value for our rejection region, that is C. So this time our probability statement is 1 minus phi of C minus 140 over 25 divided by the square root of n. The inside of that um, normal CDF is the z-score for that C under the assumption that the true population mean is 140. Now this time, since we need 10% to the right, that's going to correspond to a z-score of 1.28. We can solve this one for c as well to get c equals 140 plus 32 divided by the square root of n. All right, now we're in a fairly simple algebraic situation. We have two equations that both involve two unknowns, c and n, and we can solve these simultaneously. Here, since they're both solved for c, I can just set the right-hand sides equal to each other and solve. Overall, I get n equals 53.5 and c equals 144.4. Looking at n, we're that's going to be the sample size that we're going to require for our study in order to meet these thresholds for alpha and beta that we've set. 
Now, of course, we probably can't collect a sample of size 53.5, so we're going to need to round it. To be more conservative in our planning, we should always round that sample size up, regardless of how close it is to our floor. When we take a larger sample size in general, that's going to reduce both our probabilities of type 1 and type 2 errors. Overall, we conclude that a sample size of 54 will ensure that the probability of a false positive is less than, 10, is less than 5%, and the probability of a false negative when the true population mean is 140 is no worse than 10%, just like we hoped.